Hey everybody, welcome back. In uh, our next lecture in this series, as promised, I'm going to walk you through uh, the crash course understanding of what the mechanics behind soil liquefaction are, specifically re uh, referring to liquefaction of coarse grained or sand like soils, and uh, just introduce you to the methods that we use to predict the initiation or the triggering of liquefaction in soils in the field today. Well, again, as, as with previous lectures in this series, this is all um, very summarized and condensed material that I've taken from um, my graduate level uh, geotechnical earthquake engineering course that I teach at Brigham Young University, my, uh, my 545 class. And um, so I've condensed it down just to give you the absolute necessary uh, information that relates to uh, so that you can understand uh, the basics behind performance based liquefaction hazard uh, evaluation. So let's just jump right into this topic of soil liquefaction. Now, soil liquefaction, uh, it, it feels new, it feels exciting and great and, it, and and that's because we've only been studying it for about the last 50 years which if you think about science that's not very long at all but the truth is that that soil liquefaction has always occurred with earthquakes but it really wasn't until about you know 50 years ago or so um, maybe 55 or 60 years ago that we started to recognize it as an actual separate effect from the earthquake separate from just the ground motions that were occurring. Something was going on and we didn't understand what. When we'd see stuff like this, manholes popping out of the ground, uh, that makes us really wonder what the heck is going on. So, decades worth of research and study and, and validation and testing and theories have resulted in a pretty good understanding of the mechanics today of what causes liquefaction to occur. And I'm going to walk you through some of those basic mechanics now. So what you're looking at right now is my magic uh, gelatinous sample of soil that I put here on the screen. So I almost imagine that this soil has this like invisible boundary around it that captures both soil shown here as the yellow dots that you see um, and it's sand because the dots are yellow so I I like to think of sand as being yellow so it is sand and in between the sand particles there's blue and that's representative of water so because all you see is blue in between all of the yellow particles that means that this sand is saturated and it's also loose, meaning that there's a lot of void space between the sand. And how do I know that? Well, because these sand particles are stacked in such a way that this space between the adjacent particles is as large as it can possibly be while the particles are still touching one another. Do you see that? I can't get that space to be any larger. So because of that, we say that this sand is loose. So consider now this, this blob of sand and, and water sitting on the screen in front of you. Now if I apply a shear force, that will induce a shear stress in this uh, material, and it's going to cause these particles to want to shift relative to one another and reconfigure themselves. So what happens next? So they want to shift and they shift. But now I'm going to hit the pause button on my little instructional remote control and the particles are just caught in suspension now as they're about to do something. And what they do next depends on what happens with all of this water that's here in the pore space here in the pore space if the water can escape out of our little gelatinous mold on our screen and the water the water has a place to get out 
In other words, we use the terminology drained. If the, if the soil is drained and the water is free to go, what happens is the water leaves and it escapes and the soil is allowed to reconsolidate itself and it gains strength. So now it densified itself. Check this out. Notice that that pore space between the particles, remember how big it used to be? Now it's teeny. And why is that? Well, because we compacted our soil, or nature compacted the soil. It got the soil particles to be much closer together. And notice all of this water up here on top and on the edges. All of that is the water that used to be in the void space. And now it escaped. It got out because the soil is drained. Let's reset. Now, what if the water can't get out. In other words, even though that water wants to escape, it has nowhere to go. So we call this condition undrained. So if the soil is undrained, the poor water can't escape. And those particles, they want to consolidate and they want to get closer together, but the water is in the way. The water has to go somewhere. So because of that, the water pushes back against the particles and the particles effectively hydroplane on that water between the particles. And that hydroplaning uh, essentially causes this, this soil to behave like a fluid. A dense fluid, but a fluid nonetheless. Look at this. Is there any connection between these soil particles? Nope, none. And all we have between them is this layer of water film. And so these particles are free to move relative to one another with no shear resistance whatsoever between them. That is liquefaction. So when we evaluate liquefaction, We've learned through our studies and experience that it's important to assess and quantify three critical aspects of liquefaction. The first is what we call liquefaction susceptibility. Susceptibility infers that some soils, no matter what their configurations are, no matter how saturated they are, and even no matter how large of an earthquake hits them, some soils just are not susceptible to that type of behavior that I demonstrated in those previous slides. So you can imagine soils that have a lot of cohesion in them, for instance, may not allow the water to separate them like that. Next is the liquefaction initiation. So if your soil is susceptible that means that it may experience liquefaction, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it will unless the earthquake is large enough to trigger or initiate that liquefaction. So we have to look at the, the specific level of seismic loading to assess whether we think that is strong enough to trigger liquefaction. And the third <coughs> is if liquefaction is predicted to occur in the soil, now we want to predict the effects that might result from that soil liquefaction. That could be in the form of settlement, that could be in the form of, um, of reduced shear strengths and, and maybe even bearing capacity or slope stability failures. That could be um, in, the, in the form of horizontal deformations called lateral spread displacement. All of those are effects that we would want to assess. So we, all three of these essentially form a chain of conditionalities. And if at any point in that chain, the answer is no, then we can stop assessing. But if we make it all the way through to effects, and we find that the predicted effects from liquefaction are both likely and unacceptable, then we need to implement mitigation or remedial effects to remove or lower the risk to our soil and our infrastructure. Now, um, I'm not going to talk about susceptibility 
Uh, and I will talk a little bit about a few of the main effects in the next lecture. But the purpose of this lecture is to focus on initiation. Okay. So we assess liquefaction initiation today most commonly using a factor of safety term. The factor of safety against liquefaction triggering. And like all factors of safety, it's the ratio of some measure of the capacity of the soil to resist liquefaction to the demand that is placed on the soil to liquefy. Another way of thinking that is it's the resistance to liquefaction divided by the loading that is trying to drive and cause liquefaction to occur. And the first tests that were performed uh, with liquefaction and trying to understand it were performed in the laboratory using cyclic laboratory t shear testing devices like the cyclic triaxial device. Today it's much more common to use things like cyclic direct simple shear device, those things. But it's the ratio of the shear stress in a given number of cycles that's necessary to, re to cause liquefaction in those number of cycles divided by the actual number of cycles of, uh, of a given shear stress that occurs. So that ratio is the factor of safety. Okay. Now what we've learned is that if we normalize if we normalize the, those shear stresses by the uh, effective stresses that are in the soil, or the confining stresses, if you want to think of that, if we normalize them, these terms now become unitless ratios of stress. And these ratios of stress, uh, we've given them names. We call them the cyclic resistance ratio. That represents, again, this ratio in the numerator that quantifies the resistance of the soil to liquefaction. And we also call it the cyclic stress ratio. That's this ratio in the denominator that quantifies the seismic loading from a particular earthquake. So the ratio then of the CRR divided by the CSR gives us the factor of safety. So how do we get the CSR? Let's focus on that first. So the CSR has multiple parts and multiple things to it. And um, one way today that, that some practitioners get the CSR is that they use what we know about site response analysis and the ability to predict actual shear strains and stresses in soil profiles and usually a one-dimensional soil profile from a given ground motion. Theoretically, then, we can use this uh, site response analysis to go straight at computing the cyclic stress ratio for a soil profile. So um, the first, then, is to do a site-specific site response analysis. And from that site response analysis, we can develop um, a whole series of um, cyclic shear stresses from the seismic loading with depth and uh, then typically we'll do multiple ground motions that we may then average and we call that then our um, CSR profile with depth. Um, from that of course then if, if we normalize these uh, cyclic shear stresses by their corresponding um, effective stresses at the various depths then we produce a plot of CSR with depth. So that's one way to do it but it requires a site response analysis. The way that more people use it instead is to use what's uh, been termed the simplified method for liquefaction uh, hazard assessment. And it was originally introduced by pioneers in the study, um, Harry Seed, the former and late Harry Seed, from, who was a professor at UC Berkeley. And at the time, his PhD student, Izat, or, or more commonly, uh, he goes by the name Ed Idris, uh, and they published a landmark paper in 1971 that introduced this simplified, approximated approach that most engineers use today to approximate the CSR 
using values and terms that are readily available to engineers today. So um, let's walk through that derivation just for everybody's benefit. So let's say I've got the, a ground surface here. Uh, this was a screenshot, by the way, this image. This was a screenshot I took on some line-ruled paper from some notes I took in college once. <laughs> so you have to live with that line rule, sorry. But I've got the ground surface here. And um, what I've got also is a very small, an infinitely small unit of soil, a mass. And we're, we're going to say then that this unit volume of soil, that's right here, um, we know that there's going to be some uh, confining stress uh, on that beneath that little block of that unit volume of soil. And if an earthquake occurs, we know that that ground surface is going to um, accelerate and be from that earthquake. And so the peak acceleration that it experienced during the earthquake, we're going to call A max. So here's how this works. If I take the acceleration and I take um, the total stress. Remember, the total stress now is, is just the, the um, weight, which is really um, just the force of the um, of the material divided by the area beneath it that's the same as just the mass times gravity divided by the area so that's what uh, the total stress is you can see how the the gravities cancel out and I'm left with now just acceleration times mass mass times acceleration that gives me a force and I'm dividing the, the force by an area. Holy smokes, that just gave me shear stress. That's a pretty clever derivation right there. And it's very simple, very simple to calculate. So this calculation right here is the, is the, is the key calculation to this simplified method. And it really is quite ingenious. Now, there were some different things that now Id Idris and Seed needed to add. For instance, um, all of the testing and understanding we did around liquefaction were performed in a harmonic, uniform, uh, cyclic loading in a testing device. But earthquakes don't produce that type of loading. They produce loading that is uh, very non-uniform right as opposed to what we might see in a lab that looks like that so how do we convert this from the field to an equivalent laboratory loading <laughs> and so that gets tricky right so um, using some simulations and using some math and also using some uh, just common sense and, and gut check feels uh, said Seed and Idris recommended a fudge factor of 0.65 to get us from a field equivalent to a lab equivalent um, shear stress. Now our equation is going to look like this so far. Okay? Awesome! The next thing we have to do is because um, in, in the field we don't have a rigid block like we're assuming with our simplified method we have soil is flexible and it's compliant so because of that we have to modify this uh, this shear stress for a flexible or a compliant soil rather than just a um, a rigid soil and um, remember that our simplified approximation only gives us the, the calculation right here at the ground surface. But we want to calculate the CSR with depth at, at depths greater than at the ground surface. So using now lots and lots of site response analysis, we can generate ratios for lots of generic profiles of soil to give us the ratio of the flexible, 
um, shear stress. That's, that's basically the shear stress at depth instead of right at the ground surface to the, to the shear stress right at the ground surface. So that ratio is what we call R sub D, and it's, it's gained the terminology that we call the depth reduction factor. That's what R sub D is. So we're using a uh, relationship for R sub D. Now we throw that into our equation, and now our cyclic shear stress uh, from an earthquake is being represented by this equation now. But wait, there's more. If we want to turn this into CSR, then we just have to normalize it by the effective stress. So there's the effective stress on both sides of the equation, and so now this is the equation that we have. Let's talk about the cyclic resistance ratio now, the CRR. <coughs> now, originally the CRR was estimated through laboratory testing. And in parts of the world today, it still is. Like in Japan, um, laboratory testing st remains the standard of practice for assessing liquefaction resi uh, resistance in soils in the field. It's a very accurate method, but it also requires uh, very good soil sampling and very good laboratory testing. So that requires money, 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 lots of money. Here in the United States, um, we wanted a more practical, um, easier approach because we're all about practical and easy over in, in uh, this part of the world. And so because of that, we wanted to develop a field-based in situ approach to determining the CRR. But that required that we had to, one, have something that we could measure consistently in the field and relate it back to case histories of sites that we know liquefied in the past and sites that experienced earthquakes but we suspect did not liquefy in the past. So here's what they did. Um, Seed and Idris, uh, this is super clever, they went out and they started looking at cases, case histories all throughout the U.S., mostly in California at that time, and Japan, where liquefaction had been known to occur. And this it had been known to occur because there were evidences on the ground surface, things like sand boils, like cracks in the ground, like buildings that had settled. So they knew liquefaction had actually happened at that site. So what they did was they um, did some soil explorations. Uh, maybe they did some borings and they did um, SPT testing, uh, standard penetration testing. Later, other researchers came along and they went to uh, other liquefaction and non-liquefaction sites and they performed CPT or cone penetration testing at those sites. Uh, but the point is that we have to have something to quantify the resistance of the soil to liquefaction. And that really is analogous to the relative density of the soil, or how tightly, com how tightly packed the soil particles are. And then for those layers that they suspected liquefied, they also use the either their best estimate from evidences in the field uh, or site response analysis or their simplified method to estimate the CSR for each one of those layers that they suspect either liquefied or didn't liquefy. So once they had estimates of the CSR and the penetration resistance for those um, critical or suspect layers, they created plots that looked like this where the open circles represent layers or cases where no liquefaction occurred and then the closed circles represent layers or cases where liquefaction is suspected to have occurred. So do you see a pattern there? Do you see a potential boundary between the liquefaction and non-liquefaction sites? Maybe it looks something like that. Yep. And so Seed and Idris uh, 
postulated and later pr proved pretty conclusively that we could estimate the CRR boundary as a function of some measure of in situ penetration resistance by looking at actual case histories from the field. <coughs> now, the downside to this, look, you'll notice there's some open circles in places where they shouldn't be. And, and that's the weakness of this approach, is that there tends to be quite a bit of uncertainty associated with um, these methods to resist, but or the, these methods to estimate the resistance of the soil to liquefaction. But the good news is that this is super cheap. It's, it's much cheaper compared to uh, high-end laboratory testing and soil sampling. So that's how most of us estimate the CRR today. There are lots of different relationships, different databases of these liquefaction and non-liquefaction case histories, and different CRR functions to that, uh, that have been fit to that data. And we use those CRR functions or equations to estimate the CRR given some resistance, penetration resistance of our soil that we measure in the field. Now, there's other things we have to consider that we may want to correct the CRR for. For example, if I, I'm going to go back to this previous slide, all of these dots came from different earthquakes, different magnitudes, different source to site distances. So how do we get them to all have an equivalent energy or an equivalent magnitude associated with them? So initially, um, Seed and Idris only focused on incorporating uh, um, liquefaction case histories from events that had a magnitude uh, very close to a magnitude 7.5. But later we discovered that um, we can still look at liquefaction case histories from other magnitude events if we just convert that case history to an equivalent magnitude 7.5 event. So we use then what's called a magnitude scaling factor. And what this does is this just shifts our, um, it, it just shifts the resistance of our curve. Imagine, think of it as shifting the CRR up or down depending on whether more or less energy is being introduced from a, 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 a larger or a smaller earthquake respectively. So um, if the magnitude scaling factor is just equal to one, uh, meaning w w we're, it, it doesn't have any effect, we're just multiplying our number, our CRR by one, that infers that we have a magnitude, a moment magnitude of 7.5. Another factor that is commonly used is the overburden correction factor. This uh, we call K sigma. And um, what we've learned is that um, the, the overburden or the confining stress in the soil matters. And the, the more confinement there is, it will affect the resistance of that soil to liquefaction. And so we want to convert the CRR curve to an equivalent one atmosphere of resistance. Or, or I'm sorry, one atmosphere of confining stress. And that's what the K sigma value does. Now there's a third correction factor called the initial shear stress correction factor and this accounts for the fact that um, maybe your site is on non-level ground as opposed to being on level ground. So if you have soil that's on non-level ground it may be more prone to liquefaction because there's already an existing shear stress there <coughs> from the slope of the ground than um, if it was just level ground and the same earthquake hit it. So this initial shear stress correction factor, K alpha, theoretically will correct your site for non-level uh, ground conditions and also for conditions where you might have any initial shear stress in the soil. Here's the kicker though. Um, these methods are still highly suspect. The theory is good, but we just don't have the data 
to validate and really rigorously test these theories. So most engineers today neglect uh, these factors and we just assume level ground conditions even if we're not on level ground conditions. So the final equation for our CRR function where our magnitude is going to be a 7.5 our overburden is going to be one atmosphere it's going to be our CRR function times the magnitude scaling factor times the overburden correction and times if we want to the initial shear stress correction factor that's our CRR so now if we combine it all to get a factor of safety we can combine all those equations together in the simplified method and this is what we come up with it's it looks a little daunting but it's not bad believe me so now there's lots of different methods out there that give us different estimates of CRR and, and magnitude scaling factor and so on <coughs> and all these relationships are intended to help us compute whether or not given some future seismic loading level quantified by a CSR and given our ability to quantify and predict the resistance of a given soil layer to experiencing liquefaction under a given magnitude and confining stress we can now compute an estimate of the factor of safety that that soil will liquefy when exposed to that level of seismic loading. Now um, the problem with factor safety is that it implies that we have a fixed CRR boundary but if you recall from our discussion we were adding all of these um, conversion factors and shifting the CRR boundary all over the place um, to make matters worse in the last 20 years or so engineers have been shifting the CRR boundary um, downwards <coughs> excuse me in order to be conservative so w when people are computing factors of safety they're computing already loaded and already over conservative factors of safety because the CRR boundaries from which they um, that from the CRR boundaries which they used for the, that factor of safety has already been shifted to be conservative. So starting um, about oh, less than 20 years ago researchers had this really clever idea which is rather than compute factors of safety why don't we just use the data as is to say if if you give me any location say that location right there <coughs> given this data that's plotted of liquefaction and non-liquefaction case histories I can compute what's called the probability of liquefaction for that data point on this plot and and so we have for instance a line that represents what the statistics tell us is the 50 percent probability of liquefaction meaning that it's like a coin flip it might liquefy it might not and notice how that line runs right through the middle of the liquefaction and non-liquefaction case histories so that's that implies it's the boundary between those and um, then if I go up then my probability of liquefaction also goes up and if I go down from that boundary my probability of liquefaction also goes down uh, and so this was a clever way to quantify then um, the probability of liquefaction now <coughs> most methods today that have been published these probabilistic liquefaction triggering methods most of them have recommended using a probability of liquefaction of 15 percent as a deterministic CRR boundary but do you see what I mean now when I say it's a conservative boundary it's not the best fit boundary it's been shifted downward to be conservative it's a probability of liquefaction of 15 percent instead of 50 percent so um, that's what if, if you want to compute a factor of safety most people today use these 
conservative deterministic CRR boundaries. So, uh, in, to, to summarize what the probability of liquefaction is, if, if given a seismic loading and a, a penetration resistance value for a given soil layer, we can use the case history data points to compute what the probability of liquefaction of that point is in um, that liquefaction space. Now, um, factor of safety, as we've already talked about it, and probability of liquefaction are related mathematically. And we can actually um, convert back and forth between the two if we want to. And if you want to learn how to do that, there's a reference that you can look up in uh, Google Scholar or, or uh, in the references of our report uh, of Kristen Ulmer and, and some of my other students that was published in 2015 that provide the equations that relate factor of safety and probability of liquefaction. Um, so that's, that can be a handy relationship. This is a probability of liquefaction heat map that we developed for a popular probabilistic liquefaction triggering method uh, published in 2012 by uh, Boulanger and Idris. And so the red is, li is liquefaction and blue is not liquefaction and everything that's gray and white is where it 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 trans uh, it, it converts from no liquefaction to liquefaction, so that's right around a, a probability of liquefaction of 50 percent or so. So you can see how if um, somebody could come in and say their point fell right there on the plot, you could look at that and say, well, that point corresponds to point. 2.5 probability of liquefaction. So that means that that soil layer has a 25% probability of liquefaction given that particular level of, of seismic loading. Um, conversely, if it plotted right there, it would be a 70% probability of liquefaction. And if it's in the solid red, you can see it is a 100% uh, probability of liquefaction. So. Uh, I like probability of liquefaction and in um, the performance-based liquefaction hazard analysis approach we're going to use probability of li liquefaction a lot uh, because it, it actually assigns a level of likelihood or, or quantifies the, the, the likelihood of liquefaction occurring in that soil layer from that given earthquake or that, that level of seismic loading which is very, very useful. Okay, so that wraps up our crash course in soil liquefaction and liquefaction initiation. The next lecture is going to be a crash course in learning about two of the most common effects associated with liquefaction, which is liquefaction-induced settlement or seismic compaction and lateral spread displacement. That's liquefaction-induced horizontal displacement of the ground. So stay tuned. Feel free to jump into that next lecture when you're ready, and we'll do some learning. Thanks for your attention.